Mayflower is an immigrant story, and many people uh, in this country uh, have come here across the ocean to a place they're not sure where they're going to, uh, to a life that they're not sure what it's going to be like. And that's, that's the Mayflower story, and it touches many people all over the world. The Mayflower II, an authentic 1950s replica of the original pilgrim ship, was in dry dock in January of 2011. It was at Fairhaven Shipyard for a routine inspection, maintenance, and some restoration work. On this very frigid January day, Mayor Scott Lang visited the ship and got a personal tour from Peter Aronstam, a manager at Plymouth Plantation. Tell us about how they <clears throat> equipped the Mayflower to make sure you could get from England to, to uh, the new land and not be uh, uh, you know, not being in danger. Uh, for many of the passengers, uh, even seeing the ocean, uh, this was a new experience for them, something that they could not, <clears throat> had no experience of, and really didn't understand what they were um, undertaking to cross the ocean, as you said, in a, a very difficult time of year um, and with very limited resources bringing with them. Um, and Mayflower uh, was a, a high-tech object for its time, the way the space, space capsules are now. Uh, a ship in the 17th century was a very complex machine uh, that required uh, trained, skilled operators, sailors and masters to uh, navigate safely across the ocean. How uh, big was the Mayflower? Well, uh, Mayflower in the time period was referred to as a vessel of 180 tons. Now a ton is a barrel size, it's about four or five feet tall and it carries 255 gallons, a, a ton does. So Mayflower was a vessel that could hold 180 of those tons. But in feet dimension, Mayflower is about 106 feet long, 25 feet wide, and has a draft or draws about 13 feet of water. I see. <clears throat> and, uh, so, and all sail, that's how it was powered. Correct, yeah. She was a, full, a fully rigged ship of the time, uh, six sails, all square except for the mizzen, which is a four and a half sail and a complex uh, web of rigging to control all the sails. What's interesting, and I don't, I, I don't know that I realized this before, but the Mayflower was a cargo ship. Yeah, that's right. Mayflower's entire life, she was a merchant ship, uh, built and, and um, carried goods from place to place in England and over to Europe. Um, and only later in her life, at the near end of her life, uh, did she carry passengers that one time from England to the New World. Yeah, there were no passenger ships per se at the time. Um, when the pilgrims were immigrating to the New World, they had to look for a way to get there, obviously. And the uh, obvious choice was a merchant ship. A merchant ship could carry goods in her cargo deck, and the passengers were the goods that the ship was carrying this particular time, uh, in the same way that they would pack barrels or uh, bundles onto the ship. They packed the passengers onto the Mayflower, I see. making cabins as best they could and, and um, putting them in space as, as best they could. So you didn't have the option of the Carnival Cruise Line? <laughs> Hardly, no. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's talk about this deck. My understanding is, is right now we are, we are on the mid-deck of That's uh, right. the Mayflower. So yeah. tell us about this, uh, this particular space. So this is essentially the cargo deck of Mayflower 2. It's essentially a wide open space uh, that the 102 passengers would have lived on during the crossing. As you may know, there were two ships destined to, uh, that were designed to come to the New World, the Mayflower and the Speedwell. The Speedwell proved unseaworthy, and they put as many of the passengers from the Speedwell onto the Mayflower, making conditions even more crowded, um, along with all their goods. And so those 102 left on the Mayflower, um, <clears throat> finding room wherever they could. The space that we're in, as you mentioned, is the gun room. It's a space where probably the gunner, uh, who uh, was a part of the crew, and the gunner's mate might have lived, along with the guns that they used to fire out the stern. Um, as a merchant ship, they were very concerned with piracy in the 17th century and had guns on Mayflower to protect themselves. Now, guns, you mean cannons? Cannons, uh-huh. And uh, what was the range of those cannons? Well, a uh, cannon like that we have on Mayflower could probably fire one or two miles uh, in the right conditions. So, so what, what you would do is, is uh, you'd, you'd spot a, uh, a ship that you felt was not a, a friendly ship. Mm -hmm. uh, you would uh, t turn and begin to move away from the ship. 
And at the same time, you would have the ability to repel the ship by firing your cannons. That, that was the, the first choice of a merchant ship, was to get away from those uh, pirates. Pirates generally could overpower a merchant ship. So the merchant ship would try to flee and fire its stern chasers, the guns out the gun doors, the stern gun doors, um, and keep that, that pirate ship at bay. I see, and then the other, and a lot of this had to do with the range of the cannons. I'm right, sure. right. But fortunately for the Mayflower Crossing, piracy was not. Um, there were no problems with piracy for this Mayflower Crossing. Uh, one reason we think is that they took a northerly route. They went from England north by Iceland, <laughs> Greenland, and down Newfoundland to America um, to stay away from the pirates that were generally in the southern part of the off of a, a, a little colder taking a little that colder, route. right? And obviously a very stormy crossing, as the little bit that we do. Know know, um, indicates, and Bradford mentions there was only about a f week of fair weather, then uh, there was one storm after the, after the other. How long did it take them to make their crossing? Well, the voyage itself was 66 days, but many of the passengers came on board, uh, and they left in September, uh, the beginning of September, but many passengers came on the ship in London in March, in, uh, excuse me, in July, uh, went down to Southampton where they were meeting that second ship, the Speedwell. Both ships departed. As I mentioned, there was trouble with the Speedwell twice. They put in once in Dartmouth, then again in Plymouth, England, and finally uh, left England in September of 1620. Mayflower landed in Provincetown uh, in November, but then took a month to look for a place to uh, actual settlement location and didn't get into Plymouth until December of 1620. So many passengers were living on board for over six months I see. <clears throat> and then spent the entire winter on the Mayflower. What was a typical typical day like for for a passenger? If you weren't a crew member, what was your day like? It was a one long day of probably tedium. Um, because it was so crowded, because there was so much stuff on board, people probably weren't wandering around a lot. They weren't um, up on deck very much because it was such a stormy uh, stormy crossing. Uh, they probably, and a lot of them probably didn't feel very well for a lot of the voyage because they were. It was so. Um, alien to them, the sea life. So they spent a lot of their time um, maybe reading, if they could read, singing psalms, uh, sleeping. So, so Peter, I know of, above you, you uh, talked to me about the tiller, and we're mm -hmm. going to see that again in a few minutes. But what do, we, what do we have here? What is what is this mechanism? Well, uh, this is the steering mechanism. This is the way the ship was controlled and steered. Uh, the bottom half, as you mentioned, is the whip staff. The upper part is up in the steerage cabin. The lower part here uh, of the lever helps move the tiller back and forth. Uh, it's a very simple but effective method of steering. Um, one of the drawbacks is the higher you go, the farther you have to pull that lever over to get the ship to steer. So they try to keep the whip staff short on the deck just above, but be, by doing that, you don't, you're not able to see very well for, for forward, so you have to rely on commands from the master on the deck, next deck up. Uh, there's no power on, on the replica made. No, we, um, we have a generator to run the lights and our electric pumps and things like that, but there's no propulsion, uh, mechanical propulsion for the Mayflower. We uh, are towed out of the harbor by our tug. Uh, we've used Jaguar here in Fairhaven for years and years. Um, and he, Charlie Mitchell, comes up to Plymouth and tows us out to Cape Cod and we um, sail out. In, in, in open water. And well, we know the Mitchells very well. They do a great job. That's uh -huh. a great tow company. Uh, these these uh, block and tackle here, this, this, as I understand it, provides some extra uh, strength if you need if you need to yeah. uh, really move that rudder. We call these the relieving tackles because they help relieve the strain that the helmsman is on by holding that whip staff by himself. In a stormy situation, particularly with a following sea, that rudder is going to get banged back and forth and it's more difficult to hold on with just that. So you have these tackles that the sailors can, can help uh, control them, the motion of the uh, tiller. I see, and, and basically they'd use their own arm strength right, to, right. Hold the, to hold the uh, rudder in place. Right, exactly. Peter, tell me, what am I sitting on right now? Uh, these are what we call cabins, uh, not like the uh, um, cruise line, carnival line cabin that we all know today, but uh, this is a, a small space uh, that gives a little measure of privacy. There probably was a, a bedding of straw, um, you know, in canvas, uh, and pillows and blankets and things, but it's essentially a place to sleep. A curtain? Probably a curtain for a little privacy and to keep the heat in, keep the warmth in. And this would be mine if, uh, I, if I had booked it. 
Uh, well, you'd probably have to either make it yourself or get the ship's carpenter to make it for you. As we said, this, this was I an see. open cargo deck, I and see. these cabins were not part of those Mayflower's I comp. would sleep here with my, my wife, my family, right, whatever. Right, right. Yeah, um, as we talked about, Mayflower was a very crowded uh, ship during that crossing, and people were sleeping all over the place. What makes, uh, I know we've heard about Jamestown, we've mm -hmm. heard about other settlements, but what makes uh, Plymouth different than, than those earlier settlements? Yeah, uh, Plymouth has been fortunate for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, uh, the nature of the voyage, the nature of the settling, the plantation. It was designed to be um, a new colony, a new location, families, farming, uh, permanent settlement, as opposed to Jamestown, which was more of a uh, enterprise. Uh, they, single men and gentlemen went with their servants and were going to extract goods from the ground, uh, resources from the ground, and make money uh, from the land, whereas Plymouth was there as a permanent settlement. Now, wh what is this? Uh, this is a piece of machinery. It's so made of wood. This is an what important is part of the <clears throat> machinery of Mayflower II. It's called a capstan. Um, ships uh, all through the centuries had different types of capstan. This, this one actually extends up to the deck above and can be used either on that deck or this deck or both. Bars would be slid through these um, square holes and the sailors can walk around and make the capstan spin around. From this deck you could uh, put a line around it and run it out through the stern and maybe pull the ship backwards um, along a wharf or uh, to up to an anchor or something like that. Um, from the deck above, it's used to help raise sails, raise the uh, cargo out of the hold. So this is a this is a pulley system, a kind of a winch. Yep. And yep. what the, exactly? And what this does is provide the uh, uh, the torque to, exactly. to pull the lines. Yep. Exactly. So now we're moving towards the bow of the uh, of the uh, middle deck, and again, this is living space uh, for our. Uh, 102 right. individuals on the vessel. That's right. Um, the passengers, as I mentioned, were living anywhere they, they could. This stairway that we have here is, of course, a modern convenience for our visitors who come to see us all, all during the season. Um, and forward of that is a windlass, uh, a 17th century windlass uh, used to raise the anchor on Mayflower when we're underway. Uh, also up forward in the 17th century probably is where the animals lived. Uh, there was a space called the manger, which is a series of boards used to collect uh, the debris that comes in with the anchor, uh, and that was probably the space where the goats or pigs and chickens lived. Now, Peter, we're below deck, mm -hmm. and uh, this, is, this is the lower deck now, and uh, again, can you tell us what the purpose of this deck was, and then also, uh, I know you indicated that this this particular area here is extremely important for the ship. Yeah, this is the hold, the lowest deck on Mayflower, and of course, we if we were in the water, we'd be underwater right now. Um, and this is the space where all the supplies for the ship are kept. Um, all the food for the crew, extra sails perhaps, uh, cordage, uh, water, beer, anything that uh, supplies would have been down in this space. Probably nobody living down here. It was probably chock-a-block full of barrels and crates and um, everything, uh, along with um, goods that the passengers needed to start their colony in Plymouth. So, so if, if, if we had a problem out at sea, mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to call anyone. Mm -hmm. we, we need to take care of it ourselves. Sure. So there would be, in, in essence, the ship carpenters, all the different equipment that we would need That's right. to repair our vessel. That's right. Uh, the, the ship had to be able to take care of itself for at least a year. They had su uh, supplies and provisions. They knew they were going to sail out and back um, and had a, probably a year's worth of, of food um, and material and supplies uh, to, to make that cross. So completely self-sufficient? As much as they could be. Did they do any fishing as they went? Probably not, uh, for a couple of reasons. It was a very stormy crossing, so not very safe to be on deck. And also in the deep water, uh, they um, just were not um, probably fishing. And, and didn't have the sophistication that we have today. Right, that's right. Now, th now what is this, uh, this hole here that well, we're this, looking at? This is the very bottom of the ship. This is the, the bilge where the water collects and is pumped out over the side, uh, similar to the 17th century, um, where they would have log pumps that would be fit into the bottom of the ship, and uh, the carpenter and his crew would keep track of how much water was leaking into the ship every day and try to keep it pumped out. And, and would they have a baffle that they would... That's move? right, a sort of a, a, a leather flapper, and inside was a, a, a lifting mechanism that lifted the water up through the pipe and spilled it over the side. All right, now, then the other thing here is you have the... Uh 
yeah. the plate to, uh, to seat the mast? Currently our main mast is out of the ship. It's, uh, we're doing some repair to it, but the space that it goes into is in that, that center cage there. Uh, the main mast is about 55 feet long from the keel all the way up to the top of it. Then there's another mast that goes above that. Uh, the timber is Douglas fir, uh, approximately two feet in diameter. And uh, how high? Up around 55 feet. So five stories high. Right. Now, the, the other interesting thing is I, I see there's outlines there for barrels. So they, they actually stored barrels in a uh, horizontal position. Yeah, barrels were stacked uh, down below. Barrels was a, um, a common way of storing both wet goods and dry goods. Of course, beer and water would have been stored in barrels. But things that they wanted to keep dry could also be stored in a barrel to keep the water from getting on them. This was a vessel, a sailing vessel, mm -hmm. a boat. And for some reason, we have it filled with rocks. Can you explain that, why, why we're right. carrying rocks in the well, bottom of the Well, um, it's a, about balance, and it's about buoyancy. Mayflower uh, is a very large ship, 256 tons, but 133 of those tons are ballast, and all that does is keep the ship upright in the water. If you go out and look at the ship from the side, um, and look at the big mass, and think about the sails and the wind pushing that ship over, you have to have right something over. on the right. other end yeah. to keep her from rolling right over. Right. And and in this case, it was cobblestones. Right. That's a modern thing, the cobblestones uh, for our reproduction ship. Um, in the 17th century, it was probably a lot of sand or, or uh, shale, stones. Um, interestingly, in the inventory of Mayflower in 1624, uh, some of the things uh, that were noted were shovels. And you wouldn't think shovels on a ship doesn't make a lot of sense until you start thinking about the ballast and when they're loading cargo they might have more cargo on one side or higher or lower and they'd have to shovel that ballast to different parts of the ship to keep to, the ship balanced to keep to keep it uh, in, in a on an even keel exactly which is yeah. very interesting and the whole idea is when before you set sail as your as your vessel is sitting in the water uh, you want an even keel. You exactly. want it. You want it to be perpendicular to the water. Right. Then, as as you begin to pick up speed, as you begin to pick up wind, you will list either side. That's right. But the ballast will help keep you from going too much. Now we're above decks, but we're also in an enclosed area. What, mm -hmm. what is this space? Well, this is actually one of the nicest cabins on Mayflower. It's called the Great Cabin. It's where Master Jones would have lived. Master Jones was uh, both quarter owner of the vessel and also in charge of the ship, the master of the vessel. Uh, so he had the nicest cabin. Um, he probably lived here alone, uh, might have shared it with one of the mates or uh, uh, two of the mates. We don't know. Uh, but this was his space where he lived. And this is this is a large space, light, airy, nice space. It follows the classic um, structure of hierarchy at sea. Uh, the master lives aft on the ship, and the common sailors live forward, all clumped together in a little space, dark and smelly and um, smoky. Um, the back of the ship is generally a calmer, safer place to be. The front of the ship is always going up and down and breaking the waves, whereas the back part of the ship takes advantage of that smoother water. Now, I've, I've got my uh, hands on here on the whip staff, mm -hmm. and we just uh, saw the, uh, the mechanism of it uh, below mm -hmm. on the, on the uh, middle deck. But ex explain exactly what this is. Sure, this is the way the ship is steered. Uh, it's essentially an extension of the tiller, um, and it allows the helmsman who's standing on the, in the steerage cabin here to uh, move the tiller back and forth while standing uh, in a relatively secure place. The helmsman has a binnacle, a wooden box with some compasses in it that he can look at to steer by. Um, and there's also a hatch here that the master who's standing, or a navigator perhaps, standing up on this deck above, would call down and tell him to steer one way or the other, um, or give them a compass course, uh, but it's, uh, it's the mechanism by which the ship compass is Compass is right here? Right. There's a, a wooden box and the two doors that have compasses in them. Okay. And, and, what we're, and that, that's your high tech. Right. Navigation, <laughs> right? right? Celestial right. navigation. It's, it's part process. of the navigation process. There's a cross staff, which is a, a simple device used to measure the angle of the uh, object above the horizon, from which you can get your latitude, where you are, north and south. Uh, another navigational tool is a chip log, which is used to determine the speed at which you're traveling. And of course, the compass will give you your course. So the three things, uh, a location, a course and a speed will help you determine where you are. This is a scuttle hatch, a hatch that the crew or passengers would use to come up or down. As we mentioned, the, lad, the 
stairway that we have as a modern convenience for our passengers, That's for right. our visitors. So the helmsman, helmsman knows what's, uh, who's coming and going anyway. Right. And this is a, a cabin that people are living in. This is a steerage cabin that some middle-level officers would be living in. There'd probably be beds on both sides here, ca small cabins. And so this was an active cabin. People were coming and going all the time. I see. And, and also, the, 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 the vessel is underway 24 hours a right, day. Right, right. So, so someone is always on Probably watch. always somebody on the helm. Yep. Very good. So we've inserted the, the wooden lever into mm -hmm. the capstan, which, which, as you explained before, Peter, is, is the equivalent of a winch. Right. And uh, how many crew members would be involved in turning this? Well, there's two sets of uh, bars that the sailors can push on. So there's at least one on each side here and one on each side there. So that's four. Then there could be four below. But then you could double up any one of those. So yes. you could have 16. Uh, Very good. 16 people pushing around. Uh, and then lines would be led from the knight's head back aft here to this, um, either a halyard, which would raise a sail, or a yard, or uh, a cargo tackle to get goods out of the hold. Very interesting. And, and, and again, all, all by uh, manpower. Simple uh, manipulation of the, the capstan. Being up on the uh, deck now, I get the uh, real understanding as to why, in spite of how cold it was below, the Pilgrims would have wanted to stay below, because mm. it's, it's not a heck of a lot warmer up here, even in the sun. No, it's not very pleasant. Uh, you can imagine mid-ocean, uh, very cold, always wet, waves washing aboard. It's not very safe either. Yes, no, you can see that. It could easily be swept ashore. Mm. There's a story of John Howland, who was tossed over the side of the ship during a storm. It was only saved by grabbing hold of a line that was trailing. Was it very lucky. Mm. So very lucky. That's yeah. one in a million that right, he that, he, that line. Right, that he could have very easily been lost. And uh, they, they hauled him back on. Yeah, he was brought back aboard, uh, held the halyard in his hand, and they used a boat hook, they say, to, to kind of hook him and bring him back on. Tell us what this is and sure. what it was for. Uh, this is the forward cabin on the ship, or the forecastle. Uh, it's a place where the common sailors lived uh, during the 1620 crossing. As I mentioned, there were 25 or 30 crew in total, but not all of them were common sailors. Some were officers and lived in the steerage cabin or Master Jones in the great cabin. But there were probably, uh, could have been as many as 15 or so men uh, living in this cabin. Pretty small space, but it was the typical lot of a common sailor to have pretty uncomfortable conditions. Yes, and, and uh, what else took place in this? Uh, it's also the cook room. It's the place where food was prepared for the crew and probably the passengers as well. The hearth that we have in there is a copy of one that was on the Mary Rose that sunk in the 1500s, uh, recovered in the 1970s, and we have some um, architectural, um, archaeological drawings uh, that help us design that ship, that uh, hearth. And, and basically what it was, was it was a brick oven. A br uh, yeah, there was a, a brass kettle on top, and so water could be boiled. A lot of food, a common meal was pottage, boiled oats or rice with either fish or flesh or peas uh, all boiled together. Peter, we're, we're quite up above uh, the waterline now, and, and what part of the ship are we on? This is called the command deck or the half deck. It's the deck that um, the officers would use to control the ship, command the ship. The master or navigator could stand. This is the hatch below which is the uh, whip staff, I so see. he can communicate to the helmsman from here. And the, the master or the officer of the watch can see everything that's going on on the ship from this, from this location. Yeah, this, this is a great vantage point. Now, what, what is this cabin back here? Uh, this is the last cabin um, in the stern called the Roundhouse. The Roundhouse. Uh, it's sort of an office, essentially. The best way to think about it is a place where they carried out their navigation. They might uh, use their cross staff to, to get a, a fix, and then they would work out where they were on a chart in the Roundhouse. Probably because it was so crowded in 1620 that um, some, some of the mates might have been living in, the, in that space. 
Now let's let's talk about the the passengers themselves. For a better life, they came to the many new world. of them. One of the misconceptions that people have is that the passengers were all uh, religious zealots who were coming to the new world to practice their religion for religious freedom. That not, is not essentially true. A percentage of the passengers were uh, coming uh, to separate themselves from the Church of England and to to be able to practice their religion the way they wanted to. But many of the passengers came for economic opportunity. Uh, there was unlimited land here. Uh, there was unlimited opportunity uh, for a person who could work hard and make something of their life. Um, and that sparked an interest in people um, regardless of their religious background. And then they had a tremendous amount of help from the Native Americans who were here. Can you explain how that all came about? Sure. The, um, in southeastern Massachusetts, Cape Cod in particular, there had been prior contact with Europeans. The natives had prior contact. And a lot of the times, it was not a positive interaction. There were examples of kidnappings, uh, Europeans stealing and kidnapping natives and taking them back to England. Um, there had been plagues brought to the New World unintentionally by Europeans and whole settlements. For example, Patuxet, uh, the English, the uh, native settlement, which is now Plymouth, was completely wiped out by um, plague brought by, or, or smallpox uh, brought by Europeans. So the, the reaction, the interaction with natives and, and English were uh, mixed at best. The, when the English arrived uh, in 1620, they very quickly realized they needed the help of the natives, and the natives realized the advantage to having uh, friends, English as friends, with their their gunpowder and their weapons to protect them from other warring um, native tribes. So very quickly, the two, the English and the natives, realized they could use each other, could help each other, and for a number of years, uh, they coexisted uh, uh, to each other's benefit. It's a wholesome, positive, optimistic mm -hmm. story about right. people working together and it coexisting. It can be, and, and as you alluded to, the early part of that relationship was the most profitable, the most um, cooperative uh, aspect of the relationship. They certainly um, were beneficial for each other for many years early on until um, later on when the press for land and, and um, other thing, other pressures caused the difficulties between the two sides. How long was it before that, that began uh, to... Uh, I want to say in the 1670s. So um, 50 years or so. Or so, right. And then, and then you began this, this push where we violated the native, uh, the native lands right. and, and different traditions, which, uh, which is With not a happy... King Philip's War. And yeah, which is not a happy or positive no, story not at for, all. for but, the But English. an important story to learn, as we should learn from all, the, all our past, all our mistakes, right. and, and hopefully do better in the future. And no visit to any ship would be complete without going on the poop deck, right? No, not at all. So let's go up sure. there, okay? So, Peter, we're here now on the poop deck, and uh, obviously we're high above the main deck, and uh, uh, the ship actually looks like, from a proportion to the forecastle deck, it, it's almost like a sleigh ride down. That's right. Well, that's one of the unique features of a 17th century ship, this very high stern castle uh, and much lower uh, forward castle lets the ship act like a weather vane. When there are no sails on the ship, the ship will uh, naturally point up into the wind, which is a, one of the safest ways to ride. When they came over in 1957, they went through a storm off of Bermuda, and they took all the sails off, and the crew and Alan Villiers, the captain, quickly realized the ingeniousness of having a design like this, is having that high stern, and the ship naturally pointing up into the wind, and then the ship will ride safely up and down over the waves. I see. Now, uh, the other thing that's interesting is how high above the waterline are we? Uh, we're probably 25 feet or so off the water right now where we are, and it's, this is a great vantage point. Uh, in the 17th century, the navigator could come up here with his cross staff and see clear to the horizon without sails or rigging in the way and uh, determine their location. Now, and you still would have a, a higher vantage point if you went up into the crow's nest. Right, up into the working tops, uh, you, that's of course much higher, but the sails are in front of those right. uh, many times, so it's um, a limited view. Very good. So we really appreciate you showing us around the Mayflower, and I, and I can tell you that uh, this will be every young boy or girl in our city 
Kids' imagination will be captured by just this, uh, this tremendous, tremendous uh, voyage that was taken uh, against all odds, really. But I want to thank you very much for your great pleasure. job. My pleasure. Happy to do it.